Well, that's a bit like asking, what will I do when I'm driving 120 kilometres along the, on the autostrada and, or the auto, whatever you have here, autobahn, and I'm about to crash? Well, the answer is a bit late. So it's a bit late to do what to do. I mean, theoretically, it's a bit late. No, you do what you can, but it's a bit late. And that's our problem because we only notice anger when it's bursting out the mouth. We only notice anger when the Vesuvius is exploding. So it's a bit like you, you're 120 kilometres along the road and suddenly you realise your wheels are falling off. Well, it's, you would suggest it's a bit late to notice your wheels are falling off. If you've been going to a mechanic, you wouldn't have a problem. So the, the real learning from it is you do your best, damage control, but the learning is I'd better take care of my car. I'd better start noticing the problems before they get serious. And that's where meditation comes in and that's where learning to see our mind at a conceptual level before it gets to the emotion. And that's what takes time. So that's the long-term answer. That's the, because our trouble in our culture, this is how we think. We think of these things as emotions. That means, and this is a serious point, that means we, are, we think anger is an emotion because the body is, is involved. We only notice when the body is involved. We only notice we're depressed when the body is inert in bed. So in other words, we don't see all the conceptual stories that are deep in our bones, that are deeply there all the time, chatting away, chatting away, day after year after year, and we only notice them when they come to the surface and it's too late. It's not too late, but the big learning is I've got to start seeing my mind before it gets to the level of emotion. So that's why you start with trying to control the speech, at least control your speech. Then you've got space, you start to see your mind every day throughout the day while you're walking or on the toilet, while you're doing this, and, you, and then you learn the habit of hearing all the stories building up and the aversion stories and the attachment stories because they're all conceptual stories that inform the emotions. That, 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 you understand what I'm saying? That's the long-term job. That's the real answer. So meanwhile, damage control. Try not to do too much harm. Try not to kill the person. But the real learning is to start to see your mind and all the stories before it gets to the emotion. This is a really huge point. Buddha is a, a cognitive therapist, basically. You know, that all the emotions are just, are just the tip of the iceberg. But the, our trouble is we only notice them when it gets to the level of emotion. That's why we have so much suffering. Do you get my point? This is a huge point, actually. Okay. What else? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Attachment didn't get what it wanted. That's exactly the point. And that's what we realise these three poisons. Ignorance, which we get to now, the root delusion. The main voices in daily life are attachment. Attachment is this default mode that drives us to always get what we want all the time. And the second it doesn't meet the right object, aversion, irritation, upset, annoyed, angry, depressed. They're the variations of anger. That's exactly right. Always. That's how it is. So, okay, you could argue, you know, in, in, on the path, you can use aversion. So if you can gr develop aversion for your suffering, you can give it up. So it's, it's intelligent. But the general, normal, uncontrolled attachment aversion are just these dri drives. And aversion is a response to thwarted attachment. Absolutely. When we see that, it's a revelation. Yes. From what? From what? From what? Different from what? No, it's exactly the same. No, it's not. It's exactly the same. That's my point here. You see, what we don't realise, we c we think the anger comes from having compassion. No, it comes from a misconception that the man is the blame and how dare he kick that poor innocent dog. Whereas you understand karma, you know the reason why the guy is kicking the dog because they've got a karmic connection. And then you don't have anger towards the guy. So it's the same anger, but there's just a different object. I mean, you might see war somewhere and you get angry with the people who do the bombing. It's the same anger as your attachment. You see, that's exactly the point. Your attachment only wants the nice thing to happen. So the millisecond, there's actually, see, with the dog was the extra thing of compassion. But the misconception of why the dog got kicked and who you're blaming, that's the anger there. It's the same anger as when you don't get what you want. Because your attachment at that moment only wants everything to be nice. So it's, it's another way of saying it, but it's still thwarted attachment. Do you understand? It's very interesting. Yeah. Well, that's why if you understand karma, if you understood that and that was your view that did interpret the situation, you'd still try and stop the man from kicking the dog. And you might even get mad at him, but it would be out of compassion for him. It's like compassion. It's like what are they, in English we say tough love. If you've got, you're a child, you've got a child and you've just told them four times not to do that thing and they do it, no, you go to your room. If it's genuinely, if it's for their sake and you're showing like an anger to stop them from doing the wrong thing, but it's based on compassion. But that takes time. You get my point? You don't just sit there, oh, well, it's karma, keep kicking, you know. No, no way. 
It's compassion for both. But that's a big view. That really is a big view, but this is the logic of compassion in the Buddha's view. Do you understand? What else, people? Any points? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Of course. Yeah, yeah. But is it the same mind Oh, of course it is. Well, of course, it has... Pretty I understand. Pretty much, it seems to me, we think it through, it's logical that karma is personal. It has to be. Because the person getting... There has to be a relationship. I mean, you know, you, you look at some people, and you, they don't move you. You look at other people, they, you, you attach them. You look at other people, you're angry with them. There can't be random. There's got to be karma between you. The way very much a, we see it, the way a person, the way a person appears to us is very much based on how they've treated us in the past. Like, in other words, in this life, if you've had a long history of anger with a certain person, you see them, it's really intense, isn't it? And it's not for no reason. Well, it's the same with past lives. It can't be a person who's never harmed you that suddenly that you hate them. There's just no logic to that. Karma is very personal. It's, in general, think about that. It's not random. It can't be random, you know. It's an interesting point. I don't know how... It can be, it's, I mean, it's may, way more nuanced than that, but in general, karma is personal. Oh, countless lifetimes, thousand lifetimes. It could be a million lifetimes apart, easily. You know, it's very interesting. What else, people? Any questions? No, okay. Well, let's talk about, let's keep talking about compassion a bit. We got onto it, we began with it. We're talking about it already here. Just the view of compassion is a way bigger one, you know. It's huge. It's not nearly the way we think it is, like poor people suffering, innocent victims, little doggy woggies and pussy wussies. Do you understand? <laughs> <laughs> we've got a very weak we've got a very sentimental view of compassion it's much bigger than that much bigger than that but the key point you can't have that level of compassion for others until you know your own suffering you just can't you just can't you know this is really the key that's why the wisdom wing is the powerful basis which is all the work you do on yourself understanding suffering and its causes So looking at these three toxic emotions, these three poisons, as Buddha calls, which are the summary of the 84,000, you know, the essence, the, the, the attachment aversion, they subsume to the subtlest one. Ignorance is the cause. It's known as the general name given to this root delusion, as they call it, is ignorance, marigpa, in Tibetan, unawareness. And it's this primordial misconception. So this is where the key thing to understand when you study Buddhist psychology in high school, you learn that the particular characteristic, as we're saying here, of all the neurotic states of mind, one of the characteristics is that they're disturbing. Well, that's evident. That's why we ask the question, what do I do when I'm angry? You know, because it's the emotion involved, because the body's involved and it's really stirred up and it's really intense. Well, as I said, that's the tip of the iceberg, but that indeed is one of the functions of the unhappy states of mind. And that's a fairly evident one. They're disturbing. You are disturbed. Now, the other one, which is the one that's harder to see, but which is the essence of Buddhist psychology, which we really, when we understand, really helps us understand why we suffer, is that these unhappy emotions... Um, are rooted in being misconceptions. They come in the mind from being from misconceptions deeper down. And that's that we only can get in touch with that by knowing our own mind really well. By learning Buddhist psychology and then applying that model to our own. Like using that as our map to identify what the hell is going on in here, you know. So all these unhappy emotions are based on being misconceptions. So anger. So think about it. It's not, it's not that complicated. If you're angry, think about it. What is, think of anger. What is it saying? Well, anger is saying, how dare you do that to me? I don't deserve it. That's what anger is saying. How dare that happen? You look at suffering, a war somewhere, or that dog being kicked. How dare he do that to that dog? The dog doesn't deserve it. That's the basis. That's what anger is. It's, it's, it's a view. It's a viewpoint. It's a conceptual story that's very habitual. And then when it's habitual, then it comes. That, that's what emotion is. Emotion is just the habit of thinking something that often that it explodes as feeling. And that's why we don't hear the story behind it. We just feel the feeling. That's what anger says. So that's a conception. It's a thought. Everything's a thought. Everything comes down to being thoughts. That's the fundamental in Buddhist psychology. So attachment is a thought as well. Attachment is a conception. 
Attachment is a thought that that object is delicious, that it has certain qualities, and that when I get it, I'll get happy. Uh, aversion is a thought that describes the ugliness of a, qual of a thing that is, and is the cause of my suffering. This is all implied in our mind. It's deeply intrinsic. It's deeply implicit because it's habitual. It's habitual. When you first learn music, the theory that I have to play C, D, F, it's theoretical. When you know it well, it's spontaneous. It's the same here. You know, we just know anger because it comes out naturally, so we feel the emotion of it. But you've got to go back and look in underneath it and identify the thoughts that's there, and it's a misconception. So this is a key factor of all the unhappy emotions. They're all based on being misconceptions. Whereas love, compassion, they are also based on conceptions, but they're valid conceptions. M valid means they're in sync with reality. Misconception means it's not in sync with reality. This is Buddha's point. So, the root misconception, the subtlest, the most primordial, the one that, in, that is the source of all the others, that everything subsumes down to, is called ignorance, the deepest misconception of all. And that's this ignorance, matrigpa, unawareness. So it's not in, you know, ignorance of what then? It's the obvious question. What is this ignorance? What is it of ignorance of what? Of finally, ultimately, how things actually exist. And this is, of course, a very subtle concept. I mean, we don't talk like this in normal life, you know. So already the, the attachment and anger and jealousy and the other branch delusions have the same characteristic of causing us not to see accurately what's there. So like I said, with attachment... This strong urge inside us that wants what I want. The, what, how you articulate that misconception is that that cake that's out there on that plate appears more delicious than it really is back to me. It's a misconception. Anger, when I'm full of cake and looks disgusting to me now, that's aversion because the cake looks now disgusting to me, and, and we believe in both of those stories, but they're completely projected by my mind. Well, these both come from the root delusion, the root misconception, the root projection. And this, so then the, what the Buddha is saying basically is, you know, that this root misconception informs everything that we see and brings, brings these branch delusions, but we've got to get to that root, and that's, where, that's the one we have to finally uproot. So by working in high school on our mind every day, subduing the jealousy, subduing the anger, subduing the attachment, unpacking and unraveling these emotions, hearing the stories that inform them. And this is really sophisticated stuff. This is intense practice, I tell you. It doesn't happen overnight. And the only way to undo this is by using Buddhist model. It's a very specific model, very distinct view of the mind. Then it's easier for us to hear how the root delusion functions. So what does it see? What does it say? This is where it's abstract for us. This ignorance really causes us to believe that the delicious cake exists there in the cake itself, having nothing to do with my mind. Whereas the Buddha is saying in this ultimate level, this is the subtlest level of understanding emptiness, that it all comes from my mind, that there's nothing there. There's nothing there on the plate that comes from the cake, that ugly cake, delicious cake, beautiful cake, even cake. These are concepts made up by our mind that we project onto an object. And this is, I mean, this, this sounds abstract to us. That, and that ultimately, finally, with analysis, and this is what takes years and years, we will see that there's nothing from the side of the cake, nothing from the side of the person that makes it that cake, that gives it that meaning, that we make it that. So when we hear, so in other words, the words, therefore the cake, the way to put it, the way they say it, therefore the cake, the beautiful, the delicious cake or whatever, is completely, completely lacks an intrinsic characteristic of delicious cake. So when we come to the, so everything exists like that. So the, the one they talk about a lot, of course, is the, is the object called I, the object called person. So conventionally, conventionally there is a cake. Even though there's no cake from its own side, conventionally there is a cake, but it's merely labelled cake. That's how they say it. This is the subtlest understanding of emptiness. 
Conventionally, everything is labelled, this or that, by our mind, and ultimately, therefore, lacks any intrinsic, definite, solid, inherent, independent existence there. That's the ultimate way of understanding emptiness. There are, there are different levels of understanding this dependent arising. Dependent arising is the shorthand for how things exist conventionally, and it leads us to understand ultimately how things exist. So understanding them in the, co and this is the context of the two truths. Tsongkhapa talks about Buddha's teaching on the two truths. So we, in order to understand, Buddha's saying that because of this ignorance, we get everything wrong. Everything appears wrongly to us, and this is what keeps us in samsara. So we have to cut that root delusion. Get insight into the reality that there is no independent this, independent that. So we have to understand independent of what. Well, Buddha teaches different levels of how things exist interdependently. The very first level is that things exist in dependence upon causes. Then we have a subtler level, which it, things exist in dependence upon their bits and pieces, their parts. And then finally, everything exists upon the mind calling it that. That's the subtlest meaning. So one of the analyses we have to do at a, at a grosser level is in terms of understanding what the self is, the I. So first of all, conventionally, if we're going to discuss how we see a cake, we have to, dis we have to define conventionally what is a cake. You get the definition clear, then you can begin to discuss it. So if we want to understand the nature of self, we have to first establish conventionally what is the self. Well, the words self, I, person, they're all synonymous. And we are an example of one of those phenomena. We're not a cake, we're not a cup, we're not a toilet, we're a person. We treat ourselves like toilets sometimes. But we're a person. So we fit the definition of a person. So then we have to analyze how we can we, we can we, we can how we understand the existence of the person, of this person here. And the Buddha says we get it completely wrong. We really so there's different levels of understanding this dependent arising. First of all, and that's why understanding karma is a really good way to help understand already how we are the product of causes. That there is that I, you know, I am the product of countless past causes. And you won't find any I among any one of those causes, you know. So then we go to the subtle level and we start to look at how we can see we believe there is an I in here among these parts. But the but the Buddha's saying we can you know that 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 all phenomena this is the second level of dependent arising, not the subtlest that all phenomena that exist, exist in dependence upon their bits and pieces, their parts. So, for example, the I, what are we made up of? We're made up of the body and we're made up of the mind. And in the body and the mind, we've got many, many bits and pieces. So there's thousands of bits and pieces in here that we know. If you put them all together, you get a person. Like there's many, many bits and pieces. If you put them all together, you get a building or a cup or an iPad. Bits and, you know, things are made of parts. It's fairly clear. Actually, this, this, this view is one of the arguments that Buddha has with the previous uh, Hindus, where they talked about there is an I, that is a, this, their, their concept of a self is this partless, permanent, separate little phenomenon called an Atman. The Christians call it a soul. The, the Greeks call it an essence. That's a grosser understanding, but nevertheless, it's a useful discussion to have with ourselves, a useful argument to apply. The subtlest one is that there's no I separate from the mind that calls it that. But let's do the second one. It's an interesting analysis to do. So one of the many logical arguments we need to use, you know, they talk about how if you have any effort, if you have the, you either, you know, okay, well, just let's go straight to the argument, straight to the discussion. If I say to you, I have a table and a cup and a lid, so when you hear those sounds coming out of my mouth, immediately, if you recognize the meaning of each of those words, you will suddenly, you'll do an analysis. You'll, you'll check up, won't you, to hear what I just said. And you'll quickly then assess it and you'll instantly recognize that what I just said was conventionally true. If I just said to you, I have an elephant over here, you'll, you'll, you'll feel sorry for me. Do you understand my point? So you'll immediately check and you'll, you'll instantly check and you'll realize it's true. I have a table, a cup and a lid. You'll see that that's true. You'll verify it. Then we'll carry on the conversation. If, you say, if, if I say there's an elephant, you'll walk away. 
So what we're getting at here is very simple. You, you, have, if you, you basically proved that what I said was true conventionally, and that's perfectly reasonable. It's called communication, you know, speaking the truth. So if it is true, then look at that. How many phenomena would you have to point out? It's four, isn't it? I, one phenomenon. Two, a table, a second phenomenon. Cup, a third and a lid for phenomena. So this is a very obvious argument, but this is a really crucial point, and you'll hear it. If that's a true statement, you would have to point out four phenomena that are separate from each other, wouldn't you, conventionally speaking. Another way of putting that is you'd have to point out four phenomena that exist independently of each other, wouldn't you? And that means that you'd have to point out a lid that is independent from the cup insofar as to function as a lid, it doesn't... Well, no, a lid's a mistake because it does need a cup to be a lid. So we'll change it. We'll say a biscuit. Okay? So if there is a biscuit and there is a cup, they've got to be... You got to, If you say, I have a biscuit and a cup, forget the four, then you've got to have... You've got three phenomena, or four, three or four, whatever it is. So that means you've got to prove there's one, there's a biscuit that does exist that doesn't depend upon the existence of a cup, a table, or a rabina for its existence, does it? That means it's independent. In a conventional sense, the biscuit is independent of the cup, the table, and rabina. We agree with that, don't we? So you can point out conventionally there is a biscuit. We can point out the same for each of these phenomena. So you can say simply there are four phenomena that exist independently of each other insofar as they don't, have to, they don't rely upon each other for their function. That's a very simple example. Now I'll give you another an, a, a example. I have a nose, a hand, and a foot. Now, there's four there, right? I, you agree? I, nose, hand, foot. Do you agree with that? Four. So it's got to be exactly the same. And this is where we get really tricky, you know? We've got to point out four separate phenomena. Now, the fact is we feel there are four separate phenomena. But let's f check it out. Nose, hand, foot. So there's a foot, okay? That foot does exist independently of my nose insofar as for it to function, to walk, it doesn't need a nose, does it? Do you agree with that? And my hand to pick up a cup doesn't need a foot, does it? And doesn't need a nose, you agree? So each of them you can see. So that's three. What's the fourth phenomenon I mentioned? What's the fourth? I. Right. Now we believe that there is a fourth phenomenon that does exist that doesn't depend upon the nose, the hand and the foot. We feel that instinctively. But you have to point it out. So where is it? Where is the eye in here that doesn't depend upon nose, hand, foot, or knee, or pee pee, or caca, or, 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 or love, or hate, or anger, or all the other parts? Like my friend Pende says, we believe there is an eye in here walking hand in hand with the other parts as if it were a separate part. Now, this is the grossest example. This is like the soul idea, the self. There's, there's, you know, we say there's body, mind, and soul. Buddha says nonsense. This is the grossest one. This is the grossest example. So in other words, so this is the point now. If there were another piece in here, walking hand in hand with the nose, the hand and the foot, when you insult my nose, you insult me and you say, your nose is so ugly, Rabina, I, I will say, how dare you insult me? Won't I? But then, but if the eye, like the cup and the biscuit, when the biscuit breaks, the cup won't mind, will it? You get my point? Because they're independent, aren't they? It won't be affected. So if there really is an independent eye, then the eye would be watching and going, oh, poor nose, it just got insulted. But no, we say, I, don't you insult me. As if, the, so we sort of do know the nose and the eye are connected, but we think there's a separate eye there. Are you hearing me? This is an interesting one, you know, this is a grosser example. But if they, were in deep, if they were separate, the eye wouldn't mind. When the foot gets cut off, the hand is still fine. When the nose doesn't work, the foot works beautifully. So the eye then, this is the subtlest one, it's finally you won't find a separate piece in here. You can't. And this is where they learn this for 40 years and then study and then meditate for another 40 for the penny to drop. Because we assume... So the other argument, which we think is, well, then all, you know, either we think there's an eye that, oh, it's like the owner. 
the I that owns the hand. I have a hand, we say. Well, that's two words. That's two nouns. I have a hand, like I have a cup. I have a cup is fine. There is a cup and there is an I, conventionally, no problem. But I have a hand gets tricky. Because we believe it's, we feel instinctively, and how we act and how we respond is as if there's a, and that's how we talk all day. Who do you think runs the show in here? It's this I that we really believe is the boss, isn't it? That runs everything. That's how we think. But we don't analyze it. And this is the grossest example. So there's a good, another way to do this analysis, sort of working backwards. to try and see how there can't be an I, and we don't need one anyway, Buddha says. It's an, it's an exaggeration. It's an embellishment. We made it up. We didn't make up I. We made up an independent I. There's a massive difference. So, okay, you know, if I'm holding a cup, that's an action, isn't it? And we do it automatically because we've, pro we've programmed ourselves to do this action, a simple action. But let's say I've forgotten how to do it. I've lost my memory or, you know, I've got, I've got become paralyzed. You know, I'm learning again how to do all these things. Well, you'd have an awful lot of work to do, wouldn't you, to train me to, hold, to do this action. So let's analyze all the components, all the components that are involved in this simple action of Rabina holding a cup in her right hand. You're going to have a long, long list of things, aren't you? So forget the cup part, but just of Rabina, the parts that are playing a role, many parts of my body, isn't it, for a start? So you'd have to give a long list of all the, ex give me the instructions. Well, Rabina, the thumb has to do this and the index finger has to do that and then the middle finger does this and the muscle does that and the ligaments do this and this there'd be an awful lot of pieces of my body to list in that list of the of each of the pieces that play their role in holding a cup are you with me here that's logical isn't it each thumb each piece does its own job doesn't it in other words the index finger is not fighting with the thumb because it's got its own job the thumb's got its job the the, the the pinky's got its job the wrist has its job each bit has its job do you agree with that like if you have a building, every single component of that building does its job. That nail does this bit and that nail. They all work together, but they've each got their own independent job. Would you agree? And, and two nails there is not necessary. You know, and your extra piece over there is not necessary. It's very precise. This is the type of analysis we have to do. So you analyze all the pieces of the body involved in this action. Now you've got to analyze the main player in this action is the mind, right? I mean, this is a dead body. Don't bother. Do you understand? So the parts of the mind, what's involved? I've got to have ear consciousness so I can hear your instructions. I've got to have eye consciousness so I can see. I've got to have tactile consciousness so I can feel it. I don't need smell, but I need eye and tactile and ear. And I don't need nose. I don't need smell. What's the fifth one? What's the fifth one? Taste. I don't need taste. No, no. I don't need taste, but I know three of those senses. But crucially, I need the mental consciousness. I have to have good memory. I have to be able to concentrate. I have to pay attention. All those mechanics of the mind. There's not much virtue involved in this. There's no non-virtue involved. There's going to be all the, the mindfulness, the good memory, the attention, the concentration, all those bits and pieces. They've all got to be in place. So that's many, many pieces of Rabina all involved. Do we agree here? Are we, you, hearing the, you see the analysis. So now listen, this is the question now. You could imagine, can't you, having a definitive list of all the bits and pieces of Rabina that are involved in holding the cup. You can imagine this, can't you? You can imagine this? And you'd have to really cover everything, wouldn't you? Now, the question is this. What job is left over in this action of holding a cup in my right hand? What job is left over for this precious little piece that we think is there called I? Hmm? Willingness. willingness okay good willingness is a part of the mind we've covered that the mind's covered we're talking about a piece that isn't the body and isn't the mind that's the point so what job and we believe it's there called an eye we've never analyzed it we have never checked it for a second we've never done this analysis in our whole life we assume there's a piece in there that isn't the body, that isn't the mind, that's the owner, and it's the boss. That's how we all think, like the willingness or the one who charge, the one who watches it and, and it's kind of like the boss who oversees it. But what piece is that? What is its job? But the point is, what is its job? What job is left over after I've covered all those bits? What job is left over? You see the point? Can you hear the question? Well, I want some suggestions, please. What job is left? Because we believe it's there. What job is it doing? Marius, what job is it doing? What's your name? Not Marius, you're uh, Marcus. What job is it doing? What? That's the mind, dear. We've covered the mind. That's done. 
It isn't body and it isn't mind. Remember that. It is not the body and it is not the mind. We've just covered the body and mind. What left is what piece is left? That's what we believe the creator is. If it's the universe, we need the the, the, the creator needs we believe the universe needs a creator, a boss. Well the self is like the inner creator. That's the same philosophical view of a creator. But the Buddha says it's an unnecessary embellishment that we don't need a creator and we the world doesn't need because we do the, the sentient beings do fine creating their own suffering and happiness. And we don't need an eye. The bits and pieces work fine together. They don't need a boss. That's a way of saying it, you know. What? What, darling? Oh, good, okay. Then, then the, that's another argument. No, that's nonsense. Because, listen, if I am everything, if I every... No, I know. I'm about to, dis I'm about to debate with you. So the, the two main faults we have, either we think there's an I that runs the show and, and runs everything, like the, like, the vol like the boss, you know, or oh, all of me is I. Well, if that's the case, why would I say I have a hand? If, my hand, if I am my hand, why would I say I am, have a hand? It's like saying I have an eye. And then if you have a hand and then a mind, you have as many pieces as you have as as many eyes you have. That's clearly of, uh, bizarre. And the other argument there is that the, the base... This is the subtlest one. The base, which is the hand, the pieces here. The base is the five fingers. The label we give it is hand. So hand is not the base. It can't be. So that the pieces of all here, all the bits and pieces of body and mind, are the basis for the label I. But they can't be the I. If they're the I, then the, 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 the pieces and the I, there's no separation. Yeah. What, what's that mean? What's energy, darling? Go to give me a definition. What's energy, please? Um, I would say that movement and change in what's No, darling, we've got to find a... Th we're looking for one specific thing that bears the label I. That's far too vague in general. We're looking for a thing. That's what we think the I is. We believe it's in there. This is the point. We believe there's an I. I mean, every day we say, I this and I that and you do this to me. And I said this and I did this. It was this real word for us. It's a central player in our universe. So this, another way to say it is this. We say a word. Like I said before, if we say a word, it has to have a referent object. Wait, please wait. If we say a word, it's got to have a referent object. So we say cup. If we say, I have a cup, that's valid. Because they're independent. There's a piece called, the Rabina here is a name given for this piece, and cup's a name for this piece. So we can say Rabina's holding a cup. That's a valid conventional statement. And you can point out the cup, and you can point out Rabina. There's two separate phenomena, simply speaking. But when you get I, or in, look at this one, it's easy. My cup has a base. Look at that. It's true. Conventionally, it's true. But analyze it. You, will, you cannot find two separate phenomena. Take away the base, you don't have a cup. It's not possible. So, you, so, so conventionally, my, without analysis, it's correct to say Rabina has a nose. It's a way of talking. But we, over, em, we embellish it and we think there is an eye that's separate from the nose. That's the exaggeration. We think there's a cup and a base that are separate from each other, but you won't find them. You can't, because a base, a cup doesn't exist without a base. You can't find a rabina without a nose or a hand or a, or a love or hate. Because this is the final point, because cup is the name we give to all the bits and pieces. So the subtlest meaning is the merely labelled one. The subtlest meaning is you won't find anything there that doesn't come from, that, that is not merely labelled cup. There's rabina here. Mealy labelled. This is the hardest one. This is the subtlest one to get to. But in a sense, it's easier too. And this is where the, this is the argument. Yeah, this is the, this is the logic of it. Okay, that everything comes from the mind. That you know that um, from the first time. Lummi, I'm just editing a book of Lama's opus right now. The letters he writes to prisoners into a book, and he's got one chapter on this one of mealy labelled. And he uses as a typical example, a great example. He uses the example of the alphabet. When you first went to school, and then the teacher wrote down the alphabet on the, on the blackboard. Well, it depends on your generation. Maybe it was a whiteboard, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, we, she's, so the first thing you do is you see these three lines, isn't it? There's a line that way, a line this way, and there's a line across. The, what you see is a design on the board. That's what you see is three lines. Only when she tells you that is A do you then see A. 
So A is made up by the mind. And the Buddha is saying everything in the universe is like that. So there is a basis. The basis of the label A is those three lines configured in that way. So what, as soon as we see those three lines and we're taught it's A, we forget that we were taught it's A. And then what happens is we think we see A. We don't. We see three lines. We think we see I. But what we see is the body and the mind. And then we label it I. And then we forget that we've labelled it and then we think it's real. And this is what we do with the entire universe. The same with beauty, ugliness, everything, you know. He's talking in the letter, it's a letter to a man in the prison who wrote about his sexual attachment. He said, you know, it's like there's a, there's a body there and because of past habit, you're attached to the opposite sex. As he says, it could be, like, you know, if you're a gay or a lesbian, it's all the same principle. There's a body there with a certain shape. So you're a boy in this life, as you said, with a penis, and you see a girl with breasts. So you get so that's what you that's the object out there. And because of your attachment to that shape, you then think there's beauty there. But the beauty is not in the object. The beauty is obvious. It comes from the mind. He gave all these different logical examples to prove it's true. We know this. We sort of know this. I mean, the cake is a really good example. When you're hungry. And you see the chocolate cake on the plate, the shape, and you label it chocolate cake, and then you label it delicious chocolate cake, and all the other dramas that attachment does, which then says, when I get it, I'll get happy, and all the other. But as soon as you've eaten four pieces, the cake is not even cold yet. You know, the big cake's still there, a few pieces missing out of the circle. You've eaten four of them, and now you look at the rest of the cake, and now it looks disgusting to you. Five minutes ago, it looked delicious. It's so obvious it comes from our mind, but we don't, even, we don't, we don't, we don't learn this, you know? It's so amazing. It's so obvious that it is not, there's no intrinsic. It, it's so clear that if it were really intrinsically delicious, no matter how many pieces you had, it would still look delicious. But it's really obvious it's not. This is proving this emptiness. It's not that complicated, you know. I mean, it is, but it's not. And Buddha says, for eons we've been practicing, making up stories, and we've made up the universe. In this sense, really, we literally make up the universe. We make up new things every day, and then we believe in them. So the first process is you see the base... The shape. Then you, then you see, in you, and then the mind calls it A. And then this is the next point. Then you believe in it. So that's a valid statement. That's valid. But, the, uh, but we see it as intrinsically existing in that shape. We see, the, we see the shape. We call it chocolate cake. We call it delicious chocolate cake. And then the next step is we believe it's delicious. So that's why the really profound practice every day, see the cake, relatively speaking, but don't believe in what you're seeing. This is a powerful way to practice every day. Don't believe it exists in the cake. Don't believe that A exists in those three lines. We impute that meaning. But then that's where far ultimately, con conventional, so ultimately, there is no A from its own side coming from the shape, but there is still an A on that blackboard. It functions as an A, and you put it together with other words, and it makes a word. And this is where the conventional and the ultimate put together is really is necessary to do. Because what we hear when we hear there's no A on the blackboard, we become nihilistic and say there's no A. Oh, there's no I here, there's no I, and we want to kill ourselves, you know? That's nihilism, and that's the big mistake. As Tsongkhapa says, it's so important to hear emptiness in the context of the two truths, conventional reality and ultimate then you never fall into the abyss of the great mistake, he said, you know. Because we can't help but when we hear there's nothing from the side of these parts that is an I, we naturally think, oh, well, there's no I. Well, that you just chuck the baby out with the bathwater. So it's so important to understand in the context of dependent arising, of conventional. So there is no I from its own side, but there is an I that does exist labelled by the mind. And this is the, the, the two things we have to put together that we never lose the plot, that we never become nihilistic, you know. This is the essence of it. <laughs>